morning. I'm so happy to be here. And thank you so much, Vishen, for inviting me to be part of this. So my talk is about meditation. Uh, my talk is about pain. And my talk is about compassion. So I want to tie together these three areas. So as you heard in the introduction, I do quite a lot of um, courses. I give a lot of classes and courses in meditation. And one of the things I've noticed, which I'm sure you've noticed too, is that many people have a, a view about meditation that it's like shutting yourself down. A lot of people struggle when they meditate because they try to clear their mind. And that phrase, clear your mind, is sort of thrown around a lot. Clear your mind, clear your mind, clear your mind. And of course, you're sitting there trying to clear the mind, and the mind is screaming. <laughs> and so people are struggling to clear their mind, to switch off their thoughts. To I think people are struggling because the whole concept is, is um, not helpful. Trying to sort of go into a blank state is more like trying to become unconscious. It's like being in a coma or sort of <laughs> unconscious. And so I think meditation has nothing to do with clearing the mind. It has nothing to do with switching off. It's about switching on. It's about waking up. And so the thoughts and the emotions and particularly our pain are very powerful catalysts in the practice if you can learn how to, to work with them in a creative way. So when we talk about meditation and we talk about consciousness and we talk about expanding our consciousness, which is obviously the theme here, what we're talking about is realizing that our mind is bigger than our thoughts. And some of the metaphors used for this in the texts, the ancient texts on meditation, are metaphors such as the sky or the ocean. Um, okay, so imagine you're flying in an aeroplane and you're, the aeroplane is coming down to land. You look out of the window and it's all blue sky. And then you look down below you and there's this, you know, this blanket of clouds. It's like cotton wool. And it looks very solid. The plane is coming down to land. Of course, we know that the plane is going to come down through the clouds and land. But if you didn't know that, maybe if you're a small child or, or somebody who just doesn't know how these things work, you might think that the plane is going to crash into the clouds because they look very solid. So in the metaphor, obviously, the sky is our mind, the clouds are our thoughts and emotions, and this is what happens to us, is that when we are experiencing our thoughts and emotions, especially if they're difficult, painful thoughts and emotions, we tense up because we think we're going to crash. But of course, if you understand that your mind is just like that sky and the aeroplane is your awareness and you're able to just move through, those thoughts and emotions without grabbing onto them and without pushing them away, then that's meditation. So another example is the ocean. The ocean has its natural flow, the waves. The waves are coming, the waves are going. The waves aren't separate from the ocean. They're just the natural expression of the ocean. So because of that non-separation, the ocean doesn't need to push away its waves or grab onto its waves. The ocean has no problem with its waves. So similarly, the mind doesn't need to have any problem with its thoughts and emotions if it learns just to accept. So I want to talk about a very simple meditation technique, which I'm sure you've all practiced, but I want to talk about it in this context. And that's when we meditate by focusing on our own breathing. I mean, that's a very basic, very classical meditation technique. And I want to talk about how this helps us to enhance our awareness. So when we're focusing on our breathing, 
we all know how quickly the plan fails because we sit down with the plan that we're going to meditate and we're going to focus on our breathing and then within a few seconds we're thinking about what's for lunch or the mind is, you know, going here and going there. That is where the training now kicks in because here we now have the chance to notice that our mind got lost and bring our attention back to the breathing. So we're not trying to remove the thoughts, we're just bouncing back to the present moment. So we're just leaving the thought alone. We're not blocking it, we're not chasing it, we're just letting it be and returning. So every time we return to the breath, we're strengthening our awareness. We're building our relationship with our awareness. We are being that awareness. So we're being the sky instead of the clouds. And we do that again and again and again, and obviously we're going to get stronger at it and more um, able to come back to the present moment more swiftly. But we're not looking for anything. We're not searching for anything. So this is often the problem, is that we're searching. So myself, as you heard, I, I became a monk 24 years ago. I was 21. I was incredibly tormented. Tormented by stress, tormented by unhappiness, pain, physical pain, emotional pain. And I came to the monastery to learn meditation to get rid of my pain. And what happened was I started to become kind of addicted to meditation. I was meditating in a, 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 quite a sort of addictive way. And I was, try, I was doing all these sessions of meditation and I started to get more and more depressed. I started to feel this incredible heaviness in my heart area, like a kind of sinking feeling, like a disappointment, a depression. And I went to my teacher, a Tibetan Lama, and I said, <laughs> You know, I'm doing all this stuff and it's making me depressed. And he said, no, it's not making you depressed. He said, you're, you're meditating like somebody who's taking drugs. You're, you're looking for a high. You're looking for bliss. You're searching. You're pushing. You're, you're trying to feel something. And I realized he was right. And this completely changed my attitude to meditation because I started to realize that in our life, we're always searching something, and our culture is very much a culture of exaggeration of the senses. Feel good, feel high, feel buzzy, get something. Kind of ramping up our senses. Uh, the media that we all view, the, the, the internet, the movies, it's all very snappy, very kind of uh, exciting. So we want that we want that lift. Even the food we eat is sort of laced with e-numbers and additives and buzzy chemicals to make us feel something. So then we start meditating and the same thing happens. We're looking for that feeling. We're looking for an experience. And the problem with that, I find, is that when we're searching for that experience, we're telling ourselves we don't have it. So at the same time as looking for happiness, and looking to feel good, we're creating a deficiency. We're creating a sense of lack, a feeling that it, we don't have it. So in a way, we're denigrating. We're denigrating our present experience by saying happiness is over there. And that's how we've lived. That's how we've lived in our society. Happiness is over there. If you're thin enough, rich enough, beautiful enough, whatever enough, then you'll be happy. So then we meditate and we say, if I'm blissed enough, if I'm high enough, if I'm, then I'll be happy. So the same cycle starts up again. So I think if we learn to let go of that desire and discover that happiness and joy are in this moment now, then we can start to progress. I mean, something else I can share with you from my own story is after being a monk for 12 years, I went into retreat. In our tradition, we do these really sort of extreme retreats of four years where you're, um, you're kind of locked away for four years. There's no, uh, there's no interaction with the outside world. There's no computers, no news, nothing. And you're just in retreat for four years. We were on a... Um, 
Scottish island. So you can't even <laughs> get off the island. And, <laughs> and there's a small courtyard where you can walk for fresh air, but there's a wall around it and you can't go out. I mean, this is not like a, it's voluntary, okay? It's not like you're... <laughs> <laughs> you heard I worked in prisons. It's not that kind of thing. <laughs> so, I spent the first two years in tears. I spent the first two years of that retreat incredibly depressed. And what happened when I went into the retreat was I had a lot of arrogance because I'd been a monk for 12 years. I was kind of a bit more senior than the other people in retreat. I thought, you know, I'll be fine. There was a kind of pride there, a kind of arrogance. I'll do this, I'm okay, and it crashed. I crashed into very, very severe depression and anxiety. And I remember being unable to even meditate. I remember feeling like I was falling through space um, with nothing to hold me. And it was such a bizarre combination of uh, like lying at the bottom of a well and also extreme anxiety. And the overriding sensation was uh, like a knife twisting here in my heart. And I hated it, and I cried, and I, pushed, I was pushing, pushing it away. I mean, who would want to feel like that? Of course you're pushing it away. And I really hit rock bottom. And of course, when you hit rock bottom, the only way is up. So something changed in the last half of the retreat, where I started to learn how to make friends with that feeling. It was a massive breakthrough for me, because I learned how to, instead of push away that feeling, I learned how to move closer to it. And almost that you expand your awareness, you expand your awareness around the feeling and you completely embrace it. You're opening, you're melting into that feeling. And the key is you have to drop the storyline because there was a story with the feeling. There was my past, there was this happened, that happened. Those are the storylines that we tell ourselves which actually distract us from the essence of what is going on in this moment. So when I learned how to not get caught in the story and instead relate with compassion to the feeling, it started to change. It started to melt into a feeling of love. And there's a sort of, uh, the practice is unconditional kindness. The practice is unconditional love. So you're, you're becoming one with your feeling. Until that point, there's always two things. There's the, the difficult feeling and there's me being bothered by it. There's the subject and object. I am bothered by that. If you become one with it, who's bothering who? How, how can it hurt you if you, un, if you are it and it is you? if there's a oneness. And that's what compassion is. Compassion is oneness. I don't like the word compassion. We don't have a word in English that really um, sums up what is expressed in the teachings on meditation. We use the word compassion, but it's, it's not enough because it sounds like a separation. I am looking down on you. You are sad. I am feeling sorry for you. That, that's not it. It's oneness. And it's trained through this interaction with your own mind, this interaction of non-separation, and learning that the discomfort that we experience is the key to happiness and the key to compassion. So this feeling started to shift, and the second half of my retreat was completely opposite to the first half. The first half of my retreat, the overriding image was I felt like I was inside a metal box inside a metal ball with spikes on the inside, digging into me. And any move I made, mentally or physically, the ball would roll and the spikes would dig into me. The second half of the retreat was like sinking into a comfortable bed. <laughs> you are in the comfort of your own mind because you start to make friends with yourself. So this was enormously helpful for me and something I'm still learning about and still trying to share with others around how to make peace with your mind. And so I think when we're trying to, going back to my initial point, when we're trying to clear our mind, that's like annihilation. That's a very aggressive, you know, very aggressive 
a sort of a violent thing to do, to try and empty your mind. And then when you're trying to push for a bliss or a high or a special feeling, again, that's a very aggressive. To me, it feels very aggressive because I'm telling myself, this is, this is not, this is boring. This is, I don't like this. I want to go over there. So to me, that's a kind of aggression. And then to go back to what I was saying about this very simple technique of um, when you're uh, focusing on your breathing. So you're focusing on your breathing, your mind wanders, and then there's a moment where you notice your mind has wandered. How many of you get tense with that when that happens? That's totally normal, isn't it? We, we feel like a failure. The mind wandered and we think, oh, I've blown it. And we kind of pull it back. So that's the kind of aggression, again. I would suggest a different approach. I would suggest that when your mind wanders, you realize that that is what aids you in coming back to the breath. So your thoughts are your friend, not your enemy. They're like weights on a, in a gym. If you go to the gym, you don't want to lift feathers, you want to lift weights. <laughs> so if your mind is wandering a lot, that's good because it gives you a chance to return. And that moment of recognition that your mind has got lost, that moment is key. For many people, that's a moment of failure. Like I asked you, do you get tense? That's like you failed. But if, if you can learn to see that moment as a moment of success, because you were lost and now you're found, and you're back in the conscious awareness, then you're making peace with your thoughts. This is self-forgiveness, this is self-acceptance, this is compassion. And only through resolving that internal conflict can we become a more compassionate person in our external world. So I think it's very much about the, the, the journey to, uh, of friendship, friendship with your mind. Uh, so, uh, as you heard in the introduction, I was involved in the um, film Doctor Strange, and I noticed all of you put your hand up, you've all seen it. And to me, that's a very interesting metaphor for what I'm talking about. Of course, it was a, it's a Disney Marvel movie, it has to be bells and whistles, uh, big effects, that, that's part of the deal but I wonder how many people got the true message of it. I wonder how many people thought, great, if you meditate, you can fly. <laughs> I got a few emails afterwards saying, is that, you know, is that how it works? Um, if you meditate, you can open portals to another universe. That, that's not the point. Actually, all those scenes where Benedict was flying through space with kind of colors and uh, psychedelic um, goings on and hands reaching for him, kind of demonic forces. It, it's all a symbol. It's a symbol for the loss of self because the film starts with this very arrogant doctor who, who's all puffed up and he goes to uh, the ancient one and she says, it's not about you. It's not about you. And he has to... It's not that he has to remove his ego or destroy it, he has to transcend it. And so when he's experiencing all of that uh, wormhole in space and going through all that, those experiences, that's what I've been talking about. It's a symbol for uh, embracing the shadow, embracing the darkness. It's not about flying up there, it's about flying in here. If you want to fly up there, just catch a plane. It's easy. <laughs> so I think that's the important uh, message about meditation that I wanted to share with you, is that it's about compassion. And now I want to say a few more things about compassion. I think that there's a lot of people who meditate, understandably, to reduce their stress. That's fine. That's, that's okay. But there comes a point where you want to kind of go further than that. There comes a point where it's kind of beyond just relaxing. And that's what my workshop this afternoon will be about. We'll expand more on that in, in that session. 
And I think that point is where you start thinking about compassion and the idea that your practice of meditation is an act of compassion. And you are practicing in order to benefit others, not just yourself. And this is how you expand your practice. You know how when we do a session of meditation, maybe, I don't know, five minutes, ten minutes, and our mind is just wandering the whole time, and we, th we finish our ten minutes and we think, well, was that, what was that about? Was it worth it? It feels like a drop in the ocean, doesn't it? But if you motivate that practice as compassion, you're doing it for compassion, then you're taking that drop and you're putting it in the ocean. The drop in the ocean becomes the ocean. It becomes limitless. What is the ocean? The ocean is simply the total of all the drops. So when we do our meditation, and we start each session by creating a very profound intention of compassion. We want to benefit all beings, and we're meditating out of love for all beings. And then at the end of the session, having a moment of dedicating the practice to all beings, a moment where you think, this, I give this to all beings. What you've done is you've, you've turned your five or 10 minute meditation into a compassion practice, and in one of the Buddhist texts it says, if, if you have a drop of water and it's just lying on the palm of your hand and you just leave it there, the drop of water just dries up. If you want to make that drop of water last forever, you take that drop and you put it in the ocean, and it becomes part of the ocean. So similarly with our practice, if our practice of meditation is very self-motivated, it's like the drop of water on the hand, it just dries up. If it's compassion motivated, it's like putting the drop of water in the ocean. It becomes limitless. What do I mean by self-motivated practice? I mean when we're just trying to get something out of it for ourselves, because the problem there is that the self is insatiable. Our self is it's like working for a boss who's never happy with anything you do. Whatever you do, the boss says, that's not good enough. I want more. You didn't do it right. The, the nagging voice of our ego is constantly telling us, you've got to be better, you've got to be bigger, you've got to be stronger, you've got to be more this, more that. Because the, the mechanism of self is all around pushing for something and pushing away something, wanting more, wanting to get away from something else, grasping after pleasure, pushing away discomfort. And this is like running on a wheel, I'm like a hamster on a wheel, you know, running, 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 but not moving. Running towards pleasure, running away from pain. That's the sort of mechanics of ego. And so when, the, when that becomes our, um, the energy of our meditation practice, the same problem happens. We start to, uh, the meditation practice actually feels like a it's like a dry, it's like a drop of water that's just dried up. It doesn't seem to, there's no juice, you know, it's just dry. And the practice becomes very unsatisfying. It becomes, well, you could experience what I experienced where I was having that sort of heaviness in my heart because I was feeling I wasn't, wasn't getting anything from it. This kind of e ego-based practice. Compassion-based practice is where you're, you're practicing for the benefit of others, which includes you. I'm not saying you're just this doormat and you're going to become this kind of martyr and help everybody and you're going to be miserable. I don't mean that. Compassion is incredibly enriching. And according to Buddhist philosophy, Compassion is the natural state of our mind. Compassion is the natural state of our mind. And I'm very interested in the links between Buddhism and neuroscience. And when we talk with neuroscientists, they talk about the natural chemistry of the body, which a baby experiences, oxytocin. You know, oxytocin is the chemical that a baby experiences when the mother 
and child, when, when she's breastfeeding the child, mother and baby go into a state of oxytocin. This is our sort of default state, uh, chemically. And oxytocin is the chemistry of love, the chemistry of unconditional love. You know, when, when it's love that needs something like a validation, it's more like dopamine, the druggy love. <laughs> when it's a love that's expanded and doesn't want anything in return, it's oxytocin. So that, to me, suggests that we are hardwired for love on a chemical level. In Buddhist philosophy, it's been talked about for centuries, but it's exciting to see how um, science is catching up with Buddhism. 2,500 years, a bit late, but anyway. <laughs> so, according to this uh, knowledge, compassion is our natural state. So, the, the, the quality of our consciousness is love. The quality of the, the, the nature of our consciousness is love unconditional love, not love that needs validation, but unconditional love. So if we are meditating with that in mind, and we're having that sense of compassionate giving in our practice, then we're on the right track. And as I said earlier, how you relate to your own discomfort is the key. It is absolutely the key. And what I try to work with myself and what I try to share with others is those tiny moments, those tiny moments of discomfort throughout the day. I find those very interesting, those tiny moments of physical and emotional discomfort. That's the practice. So when you're standing in a queue or when you're stuck in traffic, even when you're in like the hotel here, and you're pressing the button at the lift, the elevator, and you're waiting for the lift, there's a moment of waiting, isn't there? There's a moment where the body tenses up, when's the lift going to come? We see all these moments of waiting, being stuck, stuck in traffic, standing in a queue, whatever. We see these as moments of discomfort, moments of time stolen. For a meditator, these are moments of time given. Because if you can learn how to, in that moment, completely surrender, you're reprogramming your brain, you're reprogramming your heart. You're learning to meet discomfort as a friend. So it doesn't have to be a big, huge thing like sitting in a four-year retreat and having a knife twisting in your heart like I was describing. It can be a very subtle moment during the day where you feel that discomfort and instead of seeking another something to get rid of it, you meet it with love. You meet it with acceptance. These tiny micro sensations are very exciting when you learn how to work with them. Micro sensations in the body, micro sensations of tension in your shoulders, in your belly, in your hands. Learning how to be, don't even try to relax them because trying to relax is another kind of aggression. I'm tense, I need to relax. What I mean is you just meet it with awareness. This whole thing is around awareness. This whole thing is around conscious awareness, being the sky instead of the clouds. The sky encompasses the clouds. So normally when we have ten uh, sensations of tension in our body, we push them away, we hate them. But if you can relax with them and just be compassionate and be in that moment with awareness, you're making friends with reality. This is how to increase joy without looking for joy. It's a paradox. You know how people fall in love when they stop looking for Mrs. Wright or Mr. Wright? It's the same with meditation. One of my teachers once said, we are mentally very rich when we desire nothing. We are mentally very rich when we desire nothing. I think that's a very powerful statement. We're mentally very rich when we desire nothing. So what I'm saying here is that if you're trying to push yourself into a state of joy, you're just focusing on the absence of joy. You're focusing on lack. If, on the other hand, you meet pain with joy, you're programming yourself 
you're teaching yourself that you can be present and in this moment everything is there, everything you always wanted is there. And what this exercise does is a very clever thing, you know, the exercise of learning to, learning to be mindful or aware or present in traffic jams or queues or when your phone slows down, any of these kind of waiting situations. It's very clever because next time you're stuck in traffic, you're going to think, oh, great, I can try that thing now. I can do that thing I learned from that monk. Um, I'm going to do it. So you're almost saying, bring it on. Bring it on. Bring, on, bring on the pain because this is my training. So then your relationships change. That person you find uncomfortable becomes your, your friend because instead of mentally shutting down and feeling, oh, this pain, I want it to go away, you're opening to it. Your, your consciousness is expanding to just be with what is and not push anything away. So you have a kind of oneness, like a unity. And that means anytime anything goes wrong in your life, you could kind of get excited about it. <laughs> you could think, I'm going to rewire my neurons. <laughs> I'm going to change my brain chemistry. Just through, it's, it's counterintuitive, isn't it? Because normally we want to feel good, but <laughs> feeling bad. It doesn't have to be feeling bad, it's a subjective experience, it's a matter of opinion. So I'd like to just end this session with a short meditation. I know some of you are going to come to the longer session I'm doing this afternoon, but I'd love to meditate with you guys together now, if, if you like. You know, a lot of people like to close their eyes when they meditate. I do the opposite, I keep my eyes open. That's how I was taught. And the reason for that is it's about being in this moment rather than shutting down this moment or changing this moment. And the meditation I'd like to share with you, which is really easy to do here, maybe not in this room, but here, is to look at the ocean. To look at the ocean or look at the sky. So in this room, I'd like to ask you to visualize the ocean or the sky, but I'd like to also encourage you later to go and do this on the beach, where you're literally looking into the horizon, you're looking into the, where the ocean and the sky meet, and you're looking, many mile, you're looking out many miles in front of you in a straight line. Blink whenever you need to. Don't sit there with your eyes watering. Um, and what you're doing is you're mixing your, you're mixing your mind with space your mind is expanding. Your mind is becoming one with the sky. You're not kind of hemmed in, you're completely open. And all the distractions are just like waves in the ocean or clouds in the sky. And you're just almost looking through them, looking beyond them. And you're not grasping after them and going into a whole journey and you're not pushing them down. So let's try a little session like that, but it's got three steps. It's what I call a compassion sandwich. You're going to start with compassion, you're going to do the practice and then end with compassion. Compassion's either side of the technique. So let's sit up nice and straight. You can close your eyes to start with if you want, and we're going to take three deep breaths. We're going to breathe in deeply through our nose, and we're going to breathe out deeply through our mouth, just to settle. Breathe in deep. Breathe out deep. Feel your cells waking up. Breathe in deep. Breathe out deep. Feel your cells dancing. Breathe in deep. Breathe out deep. Feel your cells singing. Open your eyes. Now spend a moment generating the intention that you wish to benefit others. 
generating the intention that you wish to bring peace to this world. Generating the intention of love, unconditional love, love towards the enemy as well as the friend. Generating the wish that we may practice to wake up and wake everybody else up. Now just look straight in front of you and feel or imagine that you're looking into space, into the sky, into the sea. Your mind goes on for miles. There's no edge, no boundary. You are that space. Space can encompass everything. The, the pain, the pleasure, the distraction, the angry thoughts, the idle thoughts, the what's for lunch thoughts, the when is he going to finish thoughts. It's all there, but you are space. You're looking into that horizon where the ocean and the sky meet. Later on, you can do this for real on the beach. Now we're doing this in our mind. Your mind will get distracted. Just try to look through those distractions like clouds or waves. They're just natural. They're not to be rejected. And you don't even need to follow them. Following them is like trying to change them. Rejecting them is like trying to change them. Don't try to change yourself. You're fine like you are. Okay, now to finish the session, become aware of your body, just to ground yourself. Feel the chair underneath you. Feel all the points of contact between your bottom and the seat, your back and the back of the chair. You can close your eyes if you want to. Just feel the body where it's present, touching the chair. Feel the ground under your feet. Feel the contact between your feet and the floor. And then we end with a moment of compassion again. Make a strong intention or a prayer 
or a commitment in your heart to bring peace to the world, to bring compassion to others. Your practice is the path to compassion. And stop there. Uh, it's great to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you.